thank you for joining with me. We are in A Course in Miracles, complete and annotated edition. We are on Chapter 21, Desiring a Sinless World. And this is Section 7, The Last Unanswered Question. And we will start with a prayer, if you are able to close your eyes and join me. Dear Father, if left to my own devices, my perception will be skewed. I surrender to you everything that I think and feel. God, please take my past, plan my future, send your spirit to redeem my mind that I might be set free. May I be your channel, God, and serve the world. May I become who you would have me be, do what you would have me do, go where you would have me go, and say what you would have me say, and to whom. God, please allow me an open mind for a new experience. Thank you, God. Amen. Section 7, The Last Unanswered Question Do you not see that all your misery comes from the strange belief that you are powerless? Being helpless is the cost of sin. Helplessness is sin's condition, the one requirement that it demands to be believed. Only the helpless could believe in it. Enormity has no appeal to save the little and only those who first believe that they are little could see attraction there. Treachery to the Son of God is the defense of those who do, not, who do not identify with Him. And you are for Him or against Him. Footnote 34, Matthew 20, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Either you love him or attack him, protect his unity, or see him shattered and slain by your attack. No one believes the Son of God is powerless, and those who see themselves as helpless must believe that they are not the Son of God. What can they be except his enemy, and what can they do but envy him his power, and by their envy make themselves afraid of it? These are the dark ones, silent and afraid, alone and not communicating, fearful the power of the Son of God will strike them dead, and raising up their helplessness against him, they join the army of the powerless to wage their war of vengeance, bitterness, and spite on him, to make him one with them. Because they do not know that they are one with him, they know not whom they hate. Footnote 35, Luke 23, 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The army of the powerless who know not, what, who know not that they are trying to kill God's Son is being likened to those who crucified Jesus who knew not that they were crucifying God's Son. Back to the text. They are indeed a sorry army, each one as likely to attack his brother or turn upon himself as to remember they thought they had a common cause. Frantic and loud and strong the dark ones seem to be, yet they know not their enemy except they hate him. In hatred they have come together, but they have not joined each other. For, had they done so, hatred would be impossible. The army of the powerless must be disbanded here in the presence of strength. Those who are strong are never treacherous, because they have no need to dream of power and to act out their dream. How would an army act in dreams? Any way at all, they could be seen attacking anyone with anything. Dreams have no reason in them. A flower turns into a poisoned spear. A child becomes a giant, and a mouse roars like a lion. Footnote 36. The Mouse That Roared was a 1955 satirical book by Leonard Wibberley that was made into a 1959 movie. In it, the tiny country of the Duchy of Grand Fenwick decides to declare war on the United States with the intention of losing. 
Its army, equipped with bows and arrows, arrives in New York, where the streets have been emptied by a nuclear drill and wanders about trying to find someone to surrender to, all of which is clearly reminiscent of the army of the powerless. And love is turned to hate as easily. This is no army but a madhouse. What seems to be planned attack is bedlam. The army of the powerless is weak indeed. It has no weapons and it has no enemy. Yes, it can overrun the world and seek an enemy, but it can never find what is not there. Yes, it can dream it found an enemy, but this will shift even as it attacks so that it runs at once to find another, and never comes to rest in victory. And as it runs, it turns against itself, thinking it caught a glimpse of the great enemy that always eludes its murderous attack by turning into someone else. How treacherous does this enemy appear, who changes so much it is impossible even to recognize him. Yet, hate must have a target. There can be no faith in sin without an enemy. Who that believes in sin would dare believe he has no enemy? Could he admit that no one made him powerless? Reason would surely bid him seek no longer what is not there to find. Yet, first he must be willing to perceive a world where it is not. Footnote 37 It, where it is not, refers to what is not there to find from the previous sentence. In other words, he must be willing to perceive a world that does not contain what is not there to find, an enemy. It is not necessary that he understand how he can see it, nor should he try. For if he focuses on what he cannot understand, he will but emphasize his helplessness and let sin tell him his enemy must be himself. But let him only ask himself these questions, which he must decide to have it done for him. Do I desire a world I rule instead of one where I am ruled? Do I desire a world where I am powerful instead of helpless? Do I desire a world in which I have no enemies and cannot sin? And do I want to see what I deny because it is the truth? Footnote 38 What I denied is the real world in which I rule, am powerful and have no enemies and cannot sin. The question thus means, do I want to see the real world for the simple reason that it's the truth? You have already answered the first three questions, but not yet the last, for this one still seems fearful and unlike the others. Yet reason would assure you they are all the same. We said this year would emphasize the sameness of things that are the same. Footnote 39... Text 15, Section 11. Make this year different by making it all the same. This final question, which is indeed the last you need decide, still seems to hold a threat the rest have lost for you. And this imagined difference attests to your belief that truth may be the enemy you yet may find. Here then would seem to be the last remaining hope of finding sin and not accepting power. Forget not that the choice of truth or sin, power or helplessness, is the choice of whether to attack or heal. For healing comes of power and attack of helplessness. Whom you attack you cannot want to heal, and whom you would have healed must be the one you chose to be protected from attack. And what is this decision but the choice whether to see him through the body's eyes or let him be revealed to you through vision? How this decision leads to its effects is not your problem, 
but what you want to see must be your choice. This is a course in cause and not effect. Footnote 40. Cause here is your decision that you want to see your brother through vision. Effect is actually receiving the vision that reveals to you who your brother is. The point is that you need only concern yourself with the first. Consider carefully your answer to the last question you have left unanswered still, and let your reason tell you that it must be answered and is answered in the other three. And then it will be clear to you that as you look on the effects of sin in any form, all you need do is simply ask yourself, is this what I would see? Do I want this? This is your one decision. This the condition for what occurs. It is irrelevant to how it happens, but not to why. You have control of this, and if you choose to see a world without an enemy in which you are not helpless, the means to see it will be given you. Why is the final question so important? Reason will tell you why. It is the same as are the other three, except in time. The others are decisions which can be made and then unmade and made again. But truth is constant and implies a state where vacillations are impossible. You can desire a world you rule which rules you not and change your mind. You can desire to exchange your helplessness for power and lose this same desire as a little glint of sin attracts you. And you can want to see a sinless world and let an enemy tempt you to use the body's eyes and change what you desire. In content, all the questions are the same, for each one asks if you are willing to exchange the world of sin for what the Holy Spirit sees. For it is this the world of sin denies, and therefore those who look on sin are seeing the denial of the real world. Yet, the last question adds the wish for constancy here in your desire to see the real world, so the desire becomes the only one you have. By answering the final question yes, you add sincerity to the decisions you have already made regarding all the rest. For only then you have renounced the option to change your mind again. When it is this you do not want, the rest are really answered. Why do you think you are unsure the others have been answered? Could it be necessary that they be asked so often if they had? Until the last decision has been made, the answer is both yes and no. For you have answered yes without perceiving that yes must mean not no. No one decides against his happiness, but he may do so if he does not know he does it. And if he sees his happiness as ever-changing, now this, now that, and now an elusive shadow attached to nothing, he does decide against it. Elusive happiness or happiness in changing forms that shift with time and place is an illusion that has no meaning. Happiness must be constant because it is attained by giving up the wish for the inconstant. Joy cannot be perceived except through constant vision, and constant vision can be given only those who wish for constancy. The power of the Son of God's desire remains the proof that he is wrong who sees himself as helpless. Desire what you will and you shall look on it and think it real. No thought but has the power to release or kill, and none can leave the thinker's mind or leave him unaffected. Are thoughts then dangerous? To bodies, yes. The thoughts that seem to kill are those which teach the thinker that he can be killed, and so he dies because of what he learned. He goes from life to death and final proof he valued the inconstant more than the constancy. 
Let me repeat that. He goes from life to death, the final proof that he valued the inconstant more than constancy. Surely he thought he wanted happiness, yet he did not desire it because it is the truth and therefore must be constant. The constancy of joy is a condition quite alien to your understanding. Yet, if you could even imagine what it must be, you would desire it, although you understand it not. The constancy of happiness has no exceptions, no change of any kind. It is unshakable, as is the love of God for His creation. Sure, in its vision as its creator is in what He knows, it looks on everything and sees it is the same. It sees not the infernal, for it desires that everything be like itself, and so it is so, and sees it is so. Nothing has power to confound its constancy, because its own desire cannot be shaken. It comes surely unto those who see the final question is necessary to the rest, as peace must come to those who choose to heal and not to judge. Reason will tell you that you cannot ask for happiness inconstantly. For if what you desire you receive and happiness is constant, then you need ask for it but once to have it always. And if you do not have it always being what it is, you did not ask for it. For no one fails to ask for his desire of something he believes holds out some promise of the power of giving it. Yet may be wrong in, I'm sorry, he may be wrong in what he asks, where and of what, yet he will ask because desire is a request and asking for and made by one whom God himself will never fail to answer. God has already given him all that he really wants, but what he is uncertain of, God cannot give. For he does not desire it while he remains uncertain, and God's giving must be incomplete unless it is received. You who complete his will and are his happiness, whose will is powerful as his, a power that is not lost in your illusions, Think carefully why it should be that you have not yet decided how you would answer the final question. Your answer to the others has made it possible to help you be but partially insane. And yet it is the final one that really asks if you are willing to be wholly sane. What is the holy instant but God's appeal to you to recognize what he has given you? Here is the great appeal to reason, the awareness of what is always there to see, the happiness that could be always yours. Here is the constant peace you could experience forever. Here is what denial has denied revealed to you. Footnote 41. What denial has denied is the real world, the world referred to in the four questions in paragraph 6. For here the final question is already answered and what you asked for given. Here is the future now, for time is powerless because of your desire for what will never change. For you have asked that nothing stand between the holiness of your relationship and your awareness of its holiness. And now we will read the commentary by the Course Companions group. We are on day 260. Chapter 21, Desiring a Sinless World, Day 260, The Last Unanswered Prayer, and this is Robert Perry's commentary. I have pondered for years what the army of powerless, paragraphs 2 through 5, refers to. I finally realized that the answer is simple, group behavior in this world. If you think about it, groups do behave very much like Jesus' description of the army of the powerless. Groups typically feel disempowered even though they appear to the rest of us to be in power 
up against some vague, faceless enemy that secretly holds all the reins and is responsible for their fallen status. Hatred of this enemy is what unites them. As a result, their members only seem to be joined, and what looks like unbreakable loyalty frequently dissolves into irreparable rifts. The combination of internal disunity, a diffuse enemy, and a sense of empower disempowerment makes for irrational and unpredictable group behavior. As a result, the group tends to go galloping, galloping madly after one enemy and then another, each time thinking that this is the big one. I am hoping that particular groups come to mind as you read that, but this is not just those groups. It's most groups. What they don't realize, aside from how tragically comical their behavior looks, is that underneath it all, the real enemy they are trying to locate and defeat is the Son of God, their own all-powerful identity. Way down deep, that is the power they fear and have united against. The worldly enemies they fight are only stand-ins for this ultimate enemy. It's a chilling vision, isn't it? We have joined this army for we share its mentality. We too see ourselves as disempowered by some vague enemy out there and therefore forced to wage war, to sin. That is why the fundamental choice before us is whether we will continue to see our current world or will choose to see a new world. If we want, we can elect to see a world in which there are no enemies, where no one has taken our power, where no one has forced us to sin. That, of course, is the point of those four key questions in paragraph 6. We need to ask ourselves those questions with great sincerity. As we do, we need to realize that ruling 6-8 and being powerful 6-9 are not about the power to dominate others, but the power to heal them. These four questions, in other words, ask if we want to see a world where our healing power radiates without impediment to the dear friends we see all around us. Actually, says Jesus, we have been asking ourselves these questions. We have asked them, for instance, whenever we have questioned seeing someone as an enemy, whenever we have questioned th that we are at the mercy of events outside us. In the process, Jesus says, we have answered all but the final question. Why is the final question so hard to answer? It's because it's a statement not of what we want, but what if, about what is true. What we want can change. You can desire a world you rule which rules you not and change your mind. Truth, however, is by nature unwavering. It never changes. So to say we want to see the real world because it is the truth is to say I want to see it for reasons that are always true. In other words, I am deciding to see it always. Answering yes to the final question means thus renouncing the option to change our mind again. That's why we take so long before we are willing to say yes to that final question. It locks us in. By signing on this dotted line, we have signed a contract that can never be broken, and that scares us, and so we tend to hold that pen above the paper, hesitating for a very long time. Twice Jesus asks us to consider carefully, or to think carefully, why we haven't answered the final question. So we should do that. What is keeping us from saying a permanent, irrevocable yes to a, a sight, to sight of a world without enemies? Whatever it is, perhaps we can reflect on this. Just as truth is constant and unwavering, so is happiness. 
We think of happiness as by nature fleeting, being tied to fleeting events. What if it's the opposite? What if happiness is by nature constant? What if it only comes through wishing to constantly see the vision of the real world? The joyous world in which we have no enemies. What if happiness, in other words, comes from finally saying yes to the last unanswered question. Thank you so much, Robert Perry. Thank you for joining with me. Thank you, Emily Bennington with the Course Companions Group. This is Chapter 21, Desiring a Sinless World, Day 260, Section 7, The Last Unanswered Question. I love you.